Baldo the Guardian Owls is the weirdest game that I've played in 2021. Notice how I've said weird and not specifically bad. It's quite a perplexing indie Zelda-like title that meets jaw-dropping studio Ghibli stylized graphics that took a whopping 110 plus hours just to get to the ending. In retrospect, this game should have not taken more than 50 hours. In fact, that was what the runtime was supposed to be. But with the way the game is structured, most people won't scratch the surface of what the game has to offer, but will most certainly scratch their head in confusion when they realize that 84 years have gone by and they're still stuck in the goddamn tutorial level. And by tutorial level, I simply mean the opening village and the first dungeon. There's no proper tutorial here. At the time of writing and recording this video, when it comes to searching for reviews for Baldo, YouTube is magically a barren wasteland for some reason. There's like four to seven super brief video reviews if I'm lucky, and at the beginning stages of playing the game, I agreed with almost every single one of these videos. But at around the time I got to the halfway mark all the way up to beating the game, I no longer agreed with these sentiments. Well, most of them. And that's why I've decided to condense these 110 hours of playtime into this sort of review slash critique of the game. I'm afraid there's quite a lot about Baldo that most players will not bother to delve into, and it's not for a lack of trying. When looking at statistics in general, such as trophy percentages on PlayStation, a large percentage of people who buy any game never get around to finishing it. If these endlessly accessible, hand-holding AAA video games can't get most players to the finish line to save their lives, a game with so many accessibility barriers such as Baldo simply doesn't stand a chance. I will be dissecting these barriers in this review, but for the goal of this review is not to have an excuse just to rant about the game, at this point it would just be beating a dead horse. We are going to be looking at where the game excels, where it tragically falls flat, and what can be done to mitigate these issues. I'm also going to go ahead and say this now up front, the game is not a 4 out of 10. For me it's not. Here's the issue I take with the 4 out of 10 rating. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst, with 10 declaring that it's setting a new benchmark, a middle of the road 5 out of 10 should indicate that it's walking a thin line between being painfully mediocre and being the most horrifying thing ever made since TikTok, a 4 out of 10 is practically sending the game to the electric chair. Don't let this game fool you, it does have a boatload of technical issues, and your first few hours with the game will have you thinking that this is poorly designed at its core. That seems to be the general consensus for most people, and my initial impression was no different. Different. However, as I've come to learn the hard way over the first 38 or so long and arduous hours, Baldo isn't actually a bad game. So let's talk about it. Here's why I believe this game was dead on arrival. First of all, you've got the issue with the review embargo and lack of review copies being sent out. Obviously with my channel being as small as it is, this doesn't concern me one iota. But I feel that it's important to mention because review embargoes actually paint a big picture of whether or not there's trouble in paradise. A late embargo usually isn't a good sign, let alone no review copies at all. Just look at reviews for Kena Bridge of Spirits and you'll hear the exact same thing. The second critical flaw Baldo makes is a lack of clear direction, both in terms of what it wants its audience to be and how it tries to make that first impression with that audience. What the hell do I mean by this? Let me explain. Just a quick warning, due to the nature of this game, a lot of the late game areas and events will be shown and discussed in some shape or form, as they are essential to the points I'm about to make. This review contains spoilers. You've been warned. Let's start off with some first impressions. Right off the bat, the game starts off with a generic introduction. A girl by the name of Luna approaches this boy named Baldo, our titular protagonist sleeping under a tree in his hometown village of Kidoje. She tells Baldo that his grandfather is looking for him, so the two pay him a visit at his house. The grandfather immediately goes on to spout some expository dialogue at his nephew, acknowledging the fact that he had told Baldo this story a hundred times or more, but proceeds to repeat so anyway. The whole thing feels like it's the developers breaking the fourth wall here, as if it's the game just talking through the grandfather and telling the player, yep, I'm aware it makes no sense for this person to tell the story of his life again, to his nephew of all people, but hey, we gotta do exposition somehow. It's a bit of cheek that pokes fun at the whole idea, but it's self-aware and actually I don't mind it. The gameplay immediately starts to show some problems though, and this first one is a big one. Baldo's knees are petty. Knees weak, arms are heavy, mom's spaghetti. But on the surface, he looks calm and ready to drop bombs. Baldo has the worst fall damage system I've ever seen. This little guy can't seem to survive jumping off a small ledge to save his life. You start to get a better sense of how high is too high to fall down over time, but it never ends up feeling consistent. This creates some problems. First of all, it makes a terrible first impression about the game's difficulty and its fun factor. It's not dishonest by any means, but introducing this level of punishment in this way just by simply jumping off a height so small and inconsequential 
influential, and yet somehow it still is, I don't think that's a good way of presenting it. It creates this disconnect between the player and the world, immediately making them question the legitimacy of the game's rules and how its systems should work, if they even work at all. The second problem is that you start seeing game over screens way too early. Game over screens are never fun, not even in fair games. The way the system works is that every time you fall off a ledge that's too high, you respawn back on the ledge from where you fell off, and you lose a health point. If you do this until you are out of health points, you get a game over screen. There are two systems I could think of that could have worked way better. The first one would be to just let the player fall off a ledge, but all you do is take some damage. That way you could still be punishing the player for your quote unquote mistake, but at least it doesn't waste your time by putting you back to square one. The second system would just be to get rid of the damage but keep the respawn. Perhaps the fall damage exists because the game wants you to avoid cutting corners and finding some exploitations or any possible shortcuts, so I understand that, but the least that it could do then is just cut out the damage. Removing health points on top of the respawn is just adding insult to injury, not to mention it's completely redundant. This adds nothing to the challenge of the game, and all it does is waste your time. What also wastes your time in this game are the menu screens and the map. This map is more useless than giving Jason Momoa a bodyguard. You can zoom in, but there's no extra information that this plays on the map, so it's useless. All it does is pulsate your location radius and nothing else. It does highlight some landmarks and fast travel points such as the Owl Towers, but it doesn't tell you anything important such as the names of different houses or at least the shops. It doesn't need to spell it out with names, but at least some sort of shapes and silhouettes could help you out to make more sense of where you are. Anyway, so you wander around your home village and one of your first quests is to rescue some missing chickens. Yes chickens. And believe me, when, or shall I say if, you discover where the second chicken is, you're probably gonna be absolutely stunned with a big what in the actual fuster clock reaction written all over your face. This is one of, if not the first side quest you get, and for better or worse, it's actually the stupidest one. Depending on how you look at that, that will either set the benchmark for what's to come, or you will think to yourself that, hey, at least there's no way that the subsequent quests can get anywhere, so it's all uphill from here, right? We find the first chicken in some weird ancient tower that just happens to be in your village. You know these people are stupid when a chicken of all things is the first one to set foot in a decrepit tower all this time itself that's literally in the village. So as Baldo picks up the chicken to take it back home, the floor collapses and he and Luna fall down. The chicken's somehow still up above, somehow unscathed, and minding its own clucking business. The two of them solve a few puzzles, then a magical horn drops out of nowhere and a guardian owl shows up, telling Baldo of a prophecy and that he is the chosen one. Baldo pretty much accepts the quests given to him with no questioning or hesitation, and then sets off to embark on his epic journey, which he begins by running around the village like a complete idiot with no bearings whatsoever, making the chickens you just tried to save look like rocket scientists. Well, just like the owls, they are birds after all. I guess that confirms that Baldo takes place in an alternate reality where the birds are actually omniscient celestial beings with intellect and wisdom beyond a mere human's comprehension. Armed with that knowledge and now crippling with an existential crisis of his insignificance within the universe, Baldo finally stumbles into his first dungeon. And even more problems start to arise. Everything down here wants to kill you. Tentacles, rats, skeletons, gravity, boredom. To navigate inside the dungeons, there's actually a smaller map in the far left side of the menu screen. This could help you if you get lost, and it's so easy to miss. It tells you which room you are in, but it still doesn't tell you where in the room you are. This can be problematic within rooms that have multiple doors on any given side of a wall, and it's easy to confuse one door with another, making backtracking extremely tedious. Adding to the frustration and boredom inside this dungeon is the fact that you have nothing to fight the enemies with. This means that for the next hour or so, the game requires you to throw pots at enemies. I can kind of see the reasoning behind this decision, as the need to resort to such items supposedly should work as an intuitively organic way to introduce the concept of pots as a useful, multi-purpose tool and a gameplay mechanic, mostly used for puzzles. However, this mechanic isn't really that fun to use, like 95% of the time. Walk Walking around with pots in your hands is painfully slow, and this is just the opening section. This game will rely on pots and similar objects as puzzle mechanics for the rest of the game, and in some later areas its implementation is unfathomably stupid. It's not the puzzles themselves that are boring, it's the walking speed. I could binge watch an entire season of Friends by the time this pot ends up in the right spot. Walking speed is just ridiculous. I would have had a better time with this if Baldo could at least run at light jogging speed. I don't care about the realism in regards to Baldo finding trouble lifting the pots. All of the struggle doesn't make Baldo any more relatable or sympathetic. All it does is make me question his IQ levels. If realism was the point of the game, Baldo would have a hernia by the end of this first dungeon. What infuriates
irritates me the most about this dungeon is the fact that you get your first weapon way too late. When you obtain the sword, it doesn't feel rewarding. It just makes you wonder why you didn't have it at the beginning of the dungeon, because as you try to make it out, the combat feels more natural to engage with, as if the dungeon was actually specifically designed in mind to be completed with the sword. It doesn't negate the difficulty since you are required to get way too close and personal to even hit anything with this sword, but the pacing feels way better like this and the combat loop just feels more satisfying, so it doesn't really make sense to not have the sword at the start. In hindsight, using the pots in combat felt like an afterthought, as if it was trying to artificially spike the difficulty to pet out the length of the dungeon. So as you can see, just in the beginning section alone there is more than enough off-putting problems to make you want to uninstall the game. By the time I was done with this introductory dungeon, I had more than 10 hours of playtime locked into my save file, which in theory should have more than enough time for me to decide if I'm willing to put up with the game or not. But for whatever reason, I kept going. I think there were plenty of reasons why I kept going. First reason is obviously sunk cost fallacy. The game was supposed to be 50 hours long and given I was 10 hours in, I didn't see why I shouldn't just suck it up and see it through the end. I thought, hey, I'm like one fifth of the way through the game, right? Little did I know the first dungeon's only about 5% of the whole game. You're probably thinking the numbers are off given that it took me 110 hours to beat and this was like 10 hours in, then it should mean that the first dungeon was closer to like 10% of the whole game. Surprisingly, that is not the case. Here's the thing, most games are developed using a front-loaded approach. What do I mean by this? Well, most developers know for a fact that most players don't end up finishing a game, so what they do instead is they invest most of their effort, time and production value into making the first half of a game fire on all cylinders. This is why it's so common to see a game drop in quality the further you progress within it. It happens more often than you think. For some reason, Baldo has the opposite problem. I found my experience with the game to be front-loaded with the worst aspects and design choices, with the latter half being a completely different story. Up until the third dungeon, which is the castle, my experience with the game was downright miserable. I had to take so many breaks. However, something changed when I finished the third dungeon. As if up to this point, these struggles were simply growing pains. Up until now, I honestly thought that everything was terrible. None of it was working for me. All of that changed when I decided to step out of the castle so that I don't lose my sanity, and tried to do some other trivial side quests and aimlessly wandering around other places I've been to, just so I can find another excuse to do something else. I somehow got lucky when I happened to stumble upon a secret room in the library. I lit up a candle holder upstairs and voila. The game does hint at secret rooms when you get to the library, but this was not the secret entrance that I was expecting. There are other secret entrances in this place and I'll get to those later. The secret entrances in the library are the tipping point from where my overall experience started to change from complete masochism to a quite interesting learning curve. These secret rooms hold back so much useful and even basic information to a point where it truly baffled me. The thing is, the game tells you that these hints will cheapen the experience because the game will get too easy and then lose all sense of difficulty, but this just isn't true at all. The quests in this game are so vague and require arbitrary solutions to a point that some quests will be impossible to figure out without buying any of the library's hints. The game wants you to think you're buying some sort of cheat codes, but in reality these hints, especially when I started unlocking the secret rooms, recontextualize the whole game. Upon reading all of these notes and coming back over and over to obtain more hints, I realized that there was so much lore and thought and interconnected secrets put into all of these hints that I no longer thought of Baldo as a mindless and incompetent game with no direction or idea on what the hell it's trying to achieve. Instead, things started to make sense, maybe even too much sense. Baldo no longer seemed like a terrible experience due to technical issues, but rather, it started to feel as if that was the goal all along. I don't want to be that guy who says dumb shit like technical issues are there on purpose, it's part of the game, you know? Like some people were convinced Cyberpunk's glitches were just the main character experiencing glitches due to the cybernetics instead of the real reason being that the game shipped out as a buggy product. Technical issues in Baldo definitely make things worse than what the developers intended, but I am almost certain that the idea here was to piss people off, to make you walk away. You're just a kid after all, you don't have what it takes to beat the game. Go home to your grandpa and sit under the tree all day long, feeling disappointed in yourself. It feels as if the game was trying to say just that. There are many times where the game feels like it's trolling you, and that's where the core problem with this game seems to reside. It's not the game itself, it's the gaming philosophy behind it. Baldo is clearly trying to channel old school video games, from the simplistic and bare bones gameplay depth to the non existent plot that is just a poor excuse to give the game some sort of purpose, all the way down to the levels of frustration. With this new context, Baldo almost feels like it was made by purists 
for purists. It doesn't seem to care about being accessible and winning people over. It wants to thin out the herd, separate the wheat from the chaff, the strong adventurer from the weakling who returns home just because he gets an arrow to the knee. I wouldn't say that this is a good way to think about the people who play your game, but at least it solves the mystery of the game's underlying issues. Baldo is not a terrible game, it's simply esoteric to a fault. It's like when someone tells you a joke that they alone find funny, but then they get upset when nobody seems to laugh. There could very well be a great joke hidden somewhere in there, but if you don't preface it with the right amount of context and pace it just right, the punchline just will not work and people do walk away, and people have walked away. Knowing all of this, I started to look at the game differently, and started to have a more of a forgiving mindset, not because this game deserved the benefit of the doubt, but rather because deep down this hard to love exterior, it felt like there was a good game hidden somewhere beneath it all, and I was compelled to find it. It wasn't long after this change in mindset that the experience started to get exponentially better for me. I had finally powered through to the end of the third dungeon, and I must say, I was not expecting the reward to be this good. I had finally obtained a new tool called the Owl Bomb. This thing was a game changer, offering a completely new way of engaging in combat and puzzle solving, allowing you to completely forego the tediousness of having to carry pots to throw at levers and at enemies that need to be stunned. It didn't suddenly solve all of the game's problems, but it was a massive jolt to the system that the game desperately needed. It wasn't all smooth sailing from here on out, but the game started to feel way more engaging and for the first time in 38 hours, I was actually looking forward to see all this game had to offer and see it through. It's safe to say that one of Baldo's biggest selling points is the Studio Ghibli inspired art style. This art style is quite rare in video games, the only other game I can think of with the same style is Nino Kuni, a game that was actually developed in collaboration with Studio Ghibli itself. In fact, the first thing that came to my mind when I discovered this game is that it looked like a hybrid between Nino Kuni and Tribes of Midgard. And before I elaborate any further, I would like to thank a YouTuber called Gaming My Whole Life. I would have had no idea of this game existence if it wasn't for this great reaction video discussing the game's appeal in great detail and convinced me to keep an eye out for it. There would be no review from me if it wasn't for this channel. This guy tackles interesting games and interesting topics all the time, so go check him out. If there's one thing I can confidently say that is consistently stellar throughout the entire experience from beginning to end is the endlessly enchanting art style. Baldo the Guardian Owls looks amazing. It's one of the most beautiful looking games I've played all year. It's no masterpiece from a technical standpoint, let me make it clear, there's a lot of issues when it comes to graphical fidelity. For one, grass and foliage here just doesn't seem to look right in certain places. The main culprit here actually being the starting location, which is Kidoja Village. The blades of grass just look fuzzy and weird, and the effect is exacerbated even further if you turn off the depth of field in the settings. Depth of field really helped to mask the problem, or at least keep it to a bare minimum. Also while we are on the topic, the game offers almost no adjustable settings. I'm surprised the depth of field was even included to begin with. I played most of the game with DOF turned on. It helped to reduce the amount of things to get distracted by on the screen and have a smaller radius of vision to focus on at any given time. It also helped in making the center of the screen, especially the colors, pop out even more, giving the art style even more vibrance. At least that was the impression that I got. It's probably just optical illusions at the end of the day, but these illusions helped to sell the fiction even more, at least for me. I did turn depth of field off later on just to get an idea for the difference between the two settings, but for most of the runtime, turning it on or off doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's mostly a matter of preference, but as I said, that slight difference was enough for me to have it turned on for like 90% of the playthrough. I mostly ended up turning it off in the later sections, usually the dungeons, and here's why. These dungeons drag on for way too long, and most of the time, these locations are not really the star of the show in terms of beauty. They're mostly dark and rather dull in comparison. There's also some clues and items that usually lie just outside of your peripheral vision, and if I miss something, that usually resulted in a dungeon wearing out its welcome even more, so I kept the depth of field turned off so I don't miss anything. I've encountered some other issues too, such as floating shadows and some in-game assets not behaving the way they should, whether it was stuttering out of place, textures rapidly popping in and out, which is a shame because these few instances do take away from the hand-drawn beauty that's on display here. I'm just enamored by the use of vivid colors, the sheer variety and the use of contrast to really make every frame that's in motion come together to create that mesmerizing effect. Let's discuss the characters for a moment. Starting with Baldo, weirdly enough, I am not a fan of his design. I get that he is supposed to feel like an ordinary person in an extraordinary situation, you know, given the whole chosen one dilemma he has going on at the moment, but the biggest problem I find with his design is that nothing about him truly stands out. Usually when it comes to memorable characters, there's always at least some identifiable and instantly recognizable attribute. Even in the case of a dull character, there's usually something that the artist can use to lean into that dullness and make that 
in itself something that stands out. However, I think the one thing that Nap's team nailed with Baldo are the animations. I personally think the animations and movement for this character are really good, even if they do come at the cost of less responsive movement. They really capture that sense that Baldo has no business being here, he is vulnerable, unprepared, under-equipped, and wielding the poise of a goddamn mosquito. But what he does channel well is the patience and persistence in the hands of the right player. I personally found Luna's character more interesting. She's not really that much better when it comes to standing out, but when it comes to the human faces in this game, she is definitely up there with the best ones. Like I said, she doesn't have much going for her in any regard, but something about the way she giggles and smiles with her eyes, there's something truly charming about it and I really enjoyed that about her character. They also got another thing right with her as an NPC that tags along with you in certain sections of the world, and that is short bursts of teleportation. With the bevy of technical issues, the last thing this game needs is problems with the sidekick AI, causing problems in your journey and travels in the land of Rhodia and getting stuck everywhere. As cheap as teleporting may end up feeling like for some players, I think this was a good call. Enemy designs actually look great and the enemy variety is quite satisfying, from bats to skulls and full-bodied skeletons to giant lizards that are a pain in the ass to kill, brain-dead giants called bobos that can't take damage unless they get stunned, werewolves, giant lizards. While some of these enemies are quite formidable, these are what I'd consider the usual cannon fodder. The real highlight for me were the mini-bosses, and these usually come in two forms. First up we got the golem giants. They're like 50% Greek titans and 50% bionicle, and they usually pop up at multiple owl towers and even midway through certain dungeons. The other boss fight is called the Kangmi. This one is probably the most interesting fight in terms of mechanics. They're a rare breed that reside in very specific locations, and for a reason. These bosses offer the most interesting challenges due to having the most robust movesets and attack patterns. They are the hardest bosses I've encountered in the game, and they are not necessarily tied to the main quest. But defeating at least one of these Kangmi will be beneficial to your progress since you can unlock a discount for something called the Cold Resistant Outfit, which you will need later on in the game. But if we're being pragmatic, you're gonna need to have this outfit purchased before you even decide to fight the Kangmi since they live in the cold. Unfortunately, I learned that the hard way since in my playthrough I got stubborn and I wanted to know just how much I'd be saving on the outfit if I managed to bring some Kangmi fur back to Rhodia Town. Safe to say, I saved a lot. It's practically given for almost free after that. And since we've mentioned Rhodia Town, I think it's time to move on to discussing some of the locations. Baldo is set in the world of Rhodia, or Rhodia, which is what I personally believe to be a fictional version of Northern Italy. There are quite a few things that hint towards this, but I'll start with some of the little things. First of all, the names of the map. I can actually recognize some of these, and there are two of them in particular that stand out to me. First one is the most obvious one, and that one is that there's a place in this world called Lake Garda, which is actually a real lake in Northern Italy. The second name is a place called Caruana. I can tell you for a fact that Caruana is a surname that's commonly found in three places. Italy, Sicily, and Malta. Now this is the big one, if you take a look at the map of Italy and set the boundary limits from Trentino all the way down to Tuscany, you'll notice that Baldo's map is a fictional version of the same places. The world is huge, it's obviously no Assassin's Creed game, the only means of transportation are either via walking or fast travel, so obviously the locations, while pretty faithful to the source of the inspiration taken, are obviously shrunken down by a large margin so that Baldo can get to any place on foot, kind of like how Death Stranding sort of spans across the United States, but not really, it's actually way smaller, but for what's going on here, the map is still quite sizable and at times perhaps too big for its own good. Not all locations feel equal in their level design, but almost every location and locale is an isometric sight to behold, and some locations even being a cut above the rest, feeling more like places rather than mere locations. I'm gonna skip the first village and the first couple of dungeons because frankly, they don't do the game any justice. Instead I wanna jump straight ahead into the heart of Rhodia town, the westest west the west has ever wested since the dawn of Rhodia. And the reason I wanted to get straight into this place is because I absolutely love this little town. It it doesn't necessarily fit the criteria for buzzwords like living or breathing or god forbid string these words together in a phrase called a living breathing place, but over the course of 110 hours what this place does have is a lot of heart. This is the largest town in the game, but it is still small enough that you could end up very well knowing where every house, every shop, every landmark, every NPC and every hidden location is situated by the end of it all, and it's also enveloped quite nicely with this beautiful aqua green sea that is quite possibly modeled after the Mediterranean Sea. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
As beautiful as Rodia Town is, there are other drastically different but perhaps equally impressive locations. Jumping into a completely different setting, the southern part of the map is actually a big desert landscape and while it is probably the most visually unique location in all of Rodia, it feels a little bit too large to walk around. And most of it is a whole lot of nothing. Unfortunately, I did not spend too much time here as it feels like it was designed to be pretty much endgame content, but by the time the endgame phase began, as much as it was really starting to grow on me, I was pretty much burned out and so I made the decision to only visit the desert for main quests and nothing more. There are three other places I find noteworthy of talking about. Heading back to the north, if you travel northeast from Rodia town, you'll come across this place called Jukaturi. This place is fascinating. It revolves around an upstream river and a waterfall, and the only residents here are talking cats. These cats are my number one favorite living things in all of Rodia, and I'm a dog person. I hate to say this, but I enjoyed the lore of this place alone more than the entirety of the main quest. These cats decided to come and live here in this remote location, far Far away from human civilization. Another thing I found interesting is how the river itself plays into the dichotomy between the two types of cats that you'll find here. Cats in Jukaturi come in all kinds of colors, however their color patterns come in two different types. The cats on the right side of the river are considered pure for having one single color from nose to tail, while the ones on the left are spotted or full of color patches and they are exiled to live on the other side of the river. I love it, this place is oozing with charm. Another location I found charming is the most magical one and that is the Owl Village home of the guardian owls. Now in all honesty, the owl village isn't that dense or rich in detail, but what really sets this place apart is the lighting. It doesn't matter really if you visit during the daytime or the nighttime, this place is an excellent showcase for how Balda uses lighting effects. I have to say though, nothing does it quite like the daytime for me. The way the god rays pierce through the trees and the leaves and land softly on the wooden houses was such an impactful moment for me. The last time I felt something similar was in Biomutant, of all things, which is yet another game this year that got butchered with negative reception that I honestly had a blast with. These god rays left me in so much awe back when Biomutant came out and I'm happy to say that Baldo managed to evoke the same powerful nostalgic feeling within me. This was the moment I thought to myself, okay, this game dragged me through hell and back, but this moment right here, I think it was worth it. But that's just me. Last but not least, we have the Northern Mountain region. I think from a technical standpoint, this is the most impressive looking one of them all. The way the snow falls to the ground and mixes with the brown leaves lying on the ground at the base of the mountain, it all comes together quite nicely. Even in terms of wildlife, enemy variety and atmosphere, this place is undeniably one of the strongest ones and it's running on all cylinders. What really seals the deal in making Rodia reach its absolute peak in artistic beauty is the use of particle effects and lighting. Specks of dust float around in the sun rays, luminescent flies buzz around at night. Clouds of sand fly across the dunes in the south, and snow particles and leaves are constantly dancing to the harmony of the wind that hovers to no end around the mountainous region. As for lighting effects, I don't think I've seen something truly like this before. Baldo is drawn like a 2D motion picture as if it was made by Studio Ghibli themselves. However, the lighting engine does something spectacular here. You can especially notice this around the nighttime or in dimly lit dungeons, but the lighting effects, whether they are emitted from the lantern or the cool blue hues of the owl bomb, or even the hues from the crossbow or any other magical tool in your arsenal that uses orbs. The illumination transforms these 2D environments and makes them look 3D actually. And it looks so effin awesome. Overall, I found the presentation to be very strong. It's no holy grail of graphics benchmarks or anything like that, but artistically speaking, these visuals really struck a big chord with me. And sometimes I just want something to look very unique every now and then, and with this title, I got exactly what I was looking for. Baldo's aesthetic is unmistakable and memorable. It could iron out a few kinks here and there, but the stylized cell shading that's at work here is so stupendous that its back probably hurts from how it almost single-handedly carries the entire experience. Let's break down the gameplay mechanics for a bit now. As you have obviously deduced from the gameplay footage you've been seeing, Baldo is a 2D isometric game that's inspired by old school Zelda games with a pinch of Metroidvania thrown into the mix. You are thrown into a big fantasy world peppered with a plethora of dungeons for your main quests and then you've got the Owl Towers which act as secondary locations that you can tackle as you see fit. The game has a lot of combat but it is not the main focus. You will mostly be solving physics based puzzles. Some puzzles such as the ones you find in the Owl Towers are absolutely brilliant and enjoyable but sadly the main quest puzzles just bored me to tears. Some of the puzzles, especially the ones involving pots, have some egregious pacing issues. If prior to this video you were thinking to yourself you want to dive right in because it looks pretty and modern and something fresh, well before you do, here's something you need to know. This is a clunky ass game. Whether it's traversing the world, engaging in a fight to the death with a lizard, or simply navigating the menus, Baldo's control scheme is as unintuitive as it gets. On PlayStation 4, the X button does three things. You can activate conversations or move things in the environment, 
equipment, you can swipe your sword, or you can use a tool or a consumable that you have equipped. It really doesn't make sense to assign a conversation starter and an unoffensive attack on the same button. It's a good thing NPCs don't react when you unsheath your sword on them, or else there would be no one left alive. But even if you don't end up harming these NPCs, it's just weird that you want to chit chat with a friendly face, and what you proceed to do instead is to slice and dice their clothes off. What are you, Antonio Banderas in a Zorro movie? Another thing I don't like is how long it takes to just swap some items. Up and down on the d-pad are used to swap tools and weapons, while left and right are used to browse through the massive collection of consumables you will have accumulated within a few dozens of hours. This can get problematic later in the game due to how it takes just ages to scroll to a specific item. You also can't hold the button to keep scrolling. The menus for some reason don't let you use the thumbsticks to navigate, and they don't allow for continuous scrolling either. The oddest thing about the controls is that I don't remember if I ever used the left and right triggers. This to me feels like such a missed opportunity. Don't get me wrong, the controls do work, they're serviceable, but that's all they are. The overall gameplay loop is actually fun when the game opens up and gives you more weapons and tools. Here's some constructive criticism from my end. Let's start with the way you select weapons and consumables. Since the left and right trigger aren't mapped to anything, a better alternative would be to use the triggers as weapon wheels. Have one of them be a wheel to select weapons and tools, while the other one is a wheel to select consumables and potions. And while we're talking about consumables, you can get rid of more than half of these items. Almost every single consumable you find gives you one to two hit points back for every one quantity of an item you consume. So instead of having me scroll through 20 consumable items that are all the same, why not just simply narrow it down to like two to four consumables and assign them to a wheel menu on one of the triggers? Unless these different foods would have given different buffs or quantities of health back, which most of them don't, then there's really absolutely zero use for all of this clutter. It's impractical. An alternative way you could have implemented the trigger buttons is to hold L2 to equip an item and use R2 to use the equipped item. Certain tools such as the crossbow, the owl bomb, or the staff could have benefited from this layout because it would allow the player to then aim these tools with the right thumbstick. This would obviously mean the weapon wheels would need to be scrapped or reconfigured in some other way, but either way, even just implementing one of these solutions would have done wonders to enhance the gameplay loop. There are some other things I would have greatly appreciated during my time with the game. This game needs to shake things up so bad at the beginning, first thing that should be done is to get rid of the fall damage completely. I've given some solutions early in the video, but what I personally would like is for fall damage to go away, become non-existent. It adds nothing to the challenge of the game, and instead it only adds tedium in locations that throw in some sort of verticality to their level design. That's just how I personally feel about it. Another thing that it should do is to emphasize the importance of the library. You are already not obligated to buy anything from that place, so there's really no point in letting the character not know how useful the library truly is. By not emphasizing the importance of this building, you put most of the players at risk into not knowing that they have a choice, whereas if you make it a point to strongly emphasize that the library could make or break your ability to have fun with the game, you are giving them the option to either help themselves out or to choose to make the game challenging for themselves and never hold their hand again. There is no need to look down on players when you help them out, but there has to be some sort of way to funnel the player down into an optimal path at the very beginning to make sure that they have all the knowledge that they need and then be free to do whatever they want. Anything could make for a better opening section than the one that's currently available. Here's another problem with the library. Upon arriving, you see two pressure plates on the floor that are so obvious that you need to set something on top of them. I immediately found one of the statues that are meant to be put down on the plates, but the second one I just couldn't find for the life of me. It just didn't seem to exist. I came back dozens of times and this second statue was never to be found. Given that the game was immediately hinting that some locations require you to come back later when you unlock new tools, I was sure that I was somehow missing something and that I will need to come back later. However, what ended up happening was the most baffling thing I could ever imagine. About 90 hours into the game, I noticed that behind this one wall, there is a prompt to lift something up. Given how the first bird statue was so out in the open and that everything else in the library seemed to just be nothing but pots, I never paid any mind to it. I thought it was just a pot as well. But no, it was the other statue. Now I know what you're thinking, maybe the secret entrance was hidden like this because it doesn't want you to find it, it wants you to find the other rooms before this one. And that is a fair assumption. The only problem with that is that this secret room was clearly intended to be the first room you would find because what this room contains are the marked locations of every tool and weapon that will help you embark on this journey in the first place. If I had immediate access to this secret room, I could have dedicated some time to explore these marked locations that would have helped me increase my overall amount of hit points, I would have gone out of my way to get a useful long range weapon like the crossbow. This could have saved me dozens upon 
hunt dozens of hours. The third dungeon for some reason was the hardest dungeon in the whole game. It was also one of the longest ones. Equipped with nothing but a sword and four hit points, since I had no access to the first secret room in the library to better prepare myself, I ended up wasting over 20 hours in this dungeon alone, simply because the second statue wasn't placed in an ideal location for a player like me to find. I saw the game over screen on the PS4 blue screen of death so many times that they are now imprinted in my memory. And yes, this game crashed on me every 3 to 4 game over screens. Which is kinda weird because the first 3 days I played this, this never happened. But after those 3 days, the crashes just never went away. I wish I was kidding, but on my PS4 Pro I experienced something about 100 to 150 crashes by the time I was done. Which brings me to my next point, please fix the crashes. And here are my last 2 points of constructive criticism I wanna give. When you get stuck in a dungeon puzzle, perhaps there could be some form of hint to pop up at the bottom of the screen, telling you that if you are stuck, perhaps it's best to go back to the library and buy the appropriate hint. And last but not least, the last thing I'd wish to address is the map. More specifically the minimap. The minimap isn't perfect, but I cannot stress how many times I found it useful when going through dungeons and mazes. This minimap was a lot more useful than the large map, which leads me to my last point. The minimap was so useful that I don't know why it was hidden in the left corner of the menu. This map should be put at the bottom left of the screen. I wouldn't mind if it had to take a bit of space. After all, it is mostly comprised of white lines in the shape of boxes. So all it really needs is to just turn down the opacity and it would be just fine. This could have saved so much time going in and out of the menus. I don't mind if I had to wander around the big world without a clear map, but I can't say the same for the dungeons. Putting the minimap in the bottom left corner would have been such a lifesaver. I'll go even one step further with the minimap. Give the minimap the option to switch between different floors. The verticality within the dungeons didn't really bother me for the most part. That is until I got to a dungeon called the Bobo Pit. There was so much verticality and backtracking that I wish there was an option to switch to the upper and lower floors just so I can plan my routes better and more efficiently. I don't expect to be able to switch between floors if the minimap was in the bottom left corner, but at least I could have switched them in the minimap in the menu. This feature would have been a truly welcome addition. Now let's talk about diegetic sounds for a bit. For a game that's lacking polish and even missing sound effects in some places, Balda is actually still filled to the brim with sounds that make some places feel truly lived in. Rodia Town in particular feels lively. Signposts and doors all over town creak as they also swing back and forth during the nighttime breeze. This is also a place that is dripping with water sound effects from every side of the border, from the waves of the sea that are meandering by the docks and eroding what's left of the rocks underneath the library and the museum buildings on one side of the town. Jumping to the other side, you have water flowing underneath the town bridge that adds just enough acoustic flavor to the place that it doesn't need a cricket noise to make up for the awkward silence. Then at the end of that bridge you've got the cemetery, a place where it actually would be acceptable to have nothing but cricket sounds, but it somehow still feels weirdly alive with all of the diegetic sounds being utilized in this area. Cricket sounds are here, but there's a lot more going on actually, particularly the fact that there is an ongoing contrast between the fountains that are spouting out water making little splashes at the base, and the sea waves crashing into the cliffside underneath that both disturb the peace of the place, but also brings a weird sense of comfort. There's also seagulls, owls and other bird species that fly by and chirp and fill the atmosphere with their little tunes. However, not all the places are done well, especially some interiors. For example, anytime you visit the town chef, he's usually standing by the counter surrounded by boiling pots and pans with fried eggs, but none of these have any sound effects. The furnace behind the chef doesn't make any sound either. Every time I stopped by the place I kept expecting to hear something boiling, something sizzling and the sound of cackling of fire, but that never happened and it felt so jarring. I mostly talked about Rodia Town 
around because I honestly think this is where the sound is truly at its best. And while most other places in the map don't feel like they live up to this level of detail, they're not a total disaster either. Most of the time, the game actually does a good job at maintaining that atmospheric soundscape throughout, including the dungeons themselves. The dungeons are easily the weakest part of the games, all the way from the art design to mechanics and even here in the sound design. However, there's still just enough going on here for the sound to not feel like it's completely broken. The overall sound could have used a bit more adjusting, cranking it up in some places while toning it down in others. Some sounds that I felt should have been the loudest are overshadowed by less significant ones. For example, the Owl Museum waterfall doesn't sound loud enough. It should have this massive roar when it's coming down. However, the waves that clash with the rocks down below sound just as loud, and it just didn't feel right. Channeling through the left and right sides of the headphones is also a bit inconsistent, with some sounds shifting from left to right as expected, while other sounds don't seem to fade in or out, and instead they keep the same volume levels regardless regardless of how far or close Baldo is in relation to any sound effects. There is a variety of footstep sounds, although they could use some work. When the terrain changes, for example when running over floors made of stone, Baldo's boots sound more like a titan from Greek mythology thudding in the distance rather than a little kid wearing boots and running around town. Then you walk over to a small puddle and the splashing sounds are nowhere near as loud or reverberating. It feels so unnatural. Baldo shouldn't sound grander than the space he occupies, and unfortunately the game doesn't do the best job at conveying this. The main character Baldo actually sounds terrible. I haven't talked about voice acting because there's barely any of it here. Most of the story is told through speech bubbles, environmental storytelling, and library texts full of lore and added context to the world. So basically all sounds that Baldo and other humans have are just grunts or emotes. I don't have much of an issue with how most characters sound, but ironically enough I genuinely dislike Baldo's voice. Every time he falls to his demise or reaches out to grab a pot, it's like I'm hearing nails on a freaking chalkboard. And whenever he gets hit, I don't know what the hell that sound effect is supposed to be, but it sounds un unbelievably wrong. I don't know what they were thinking when they came up with the specific sound for this main character, but the sounds are so annoying it would even make Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels and Dumb and Dumber beg for it to stop. Now I actually would recommend for anybody to play a video game with headphones, and for the majority of this game, the sound is much more enjoyable and amplified and enriched, and I had a better time as such, but unfortunately that means that Baldo's sounds are also amplified, and not for the better unfortunately. I enjoyed the overall headphone experience, but the main character definitely took away from my enjoyment. What did not take away from my enjoyment, however, is the soundtrack. It's superb. I'm actually surprised at how good it is. Exploration music evokes this jolly feeling as you stroll around the beautiful countrysides in the villages. Battle music has that typical hint of chivalry and an upbeat energy, and while there's not a ton of variations to this one, it's still a damn good track. Dark entrances like secret underground areas, caves, or newly discovered entryways into hidden dungeons always trigger an ethereal, ambient track that is made of calm jingles and strings that made me feel heavily nostalgic about playing an old Harry Potter Potter game on Windows XP. The way the music loops back on itself has some issues, it doesn't have a seamless transition and instead there's always that split second where the cut is so blatantly obvious that there's no way you won't notice it when wearing headphones. Despite this looping issue, the tracks never seem to have gotten old or stale, even if the cuts are so noticeable and can possibly break the immersion every now and then. Unfortunately, it's an issue that persists with a lot of other tracks as well, but even these tracks do a good job of not getting on your nerves in the long run. That being said, I did enjoy a lot of what the sound has to offer. Offer. It definitely needs some work, but the overall content worked just fine enough for me. It's good enough and it does its job, so it shouldn't be a problem if you keep your expectations in check, but I know for a fact that for some audiophiles out there, this might not cut it. I've left the story for last and there's a reason. There's no real story here. All there is is a premise and a bare bones plot. Stop me if you've heard this before. You're the chosen one, you must venture forth to save the princess and you must stop the evil bad guy from doing evil bad guy stuff. Nothing we haven't seen before. And I need to make this clear, a game doing something we've seen millions of times before is not a bad thing. Not every game has to reinvent the wheel. In fact, it's really good to follow tropes every once in a while. What really matters is that the tropes are executed well, and unfortunately, Baldo the Guardian Owls takes these tropes and somehow does them even worse. To this game's defense, I don't know why anyone would take one look at this game and think to themselves, oh look, a cartoony adventure game about a hero saving the world? Wow, I've never seen that one before. I bet the story 
story's gonna blow me away and change my life forever. Yeah, um, no. Take those expectations and throw them out into the bin. Forget about the story and especially forget about that ending. Trust me, you'll thank me later. I don't want to spoil the ending, but I don't want to gloss over it either because this one could be a real deal breaker for some. All I will say about it is that if you've ever seen a video about writing or writing cliches and you've been taught about that one ending cliche that literally everyone agrees that you should never do in your book, movie or video game, this game just does it. By the time I had arrived to that point, I had already seen it online so I was way over it. But for anyone else who wishes to keep things spoiler free and then just see the ending happen the way it happens, there's no, there's, there's just no way it won't feel like a dissatisfaction. Unless you are somehow not aware of this cliche that I'm talking about, and this will be the first time you ever experience such a thing, you will not walk away satisfied with this experience. I've had a lot to say about Baldo the Guardian Owls. I will conclude this review by expanding upon my opening line. Baldo the Guardian Owls is without a shred of a doubt the weirdest game I've played all year. It's driven me up a wall, it had me conflicted, it's got more flaws than you can shake a stick at it. It's an extremely hard game and it's an extremely hard game to love. And yet, somehow by the end, it won me over. The saddest thing about Baldo is that it puts up a giant wall, a barrier between the user and the content. It's clear who this game was made for, and yet it doesn't feel sure who it wants to market itself to. There are two personalities clashing together here. There's a side to Baldo that wants to be the ultimate test of patience, perseverance and critical thinking that is ultimately more suitable to a mature audience. But it's at a conflict because it wants to embed those aspects into a game world that is more likely to be enjoyed and appreciated by a younger audience due to the overly simplistic nature of its storytelling and its themes, the overall tone, and even its gameplay mechanics. So with that being said, do I recommend Baldo the Guardian Owls? This might sound surprising to you, but I actually want to say yes. But whether or not I should outright say yes is a different story altogether. So instead, here's what I'm gonna say. The biggest reason you should play Baldo is that it has heart. As much as it is the weirdest game I've played in 2021, it's also probably the most charming one as well. If you've been here before, you'll know for sure that Resident Evil is one of my favorite ongoing gaming franchises. And yet, if I had to tell you between Resident Evil Village and Baldo this year, which of these games left me feeling empty because it lacks heart and soul, you might not be expecting this answer, but I walked away from Baldo feeling great, even with all the flaws I've described in painstaking detail. I will recommend Baldo, but not without some caveats. First things first, forget about the story. The real bread and butter of this game's storytelling comes from within the world itself. It's the town folk, the wildlife, the talking cats, the little details and references hidden everywhere, the locations, the different regions and climates, an impressive selection of bestiary that is sprinkled everywhere from one end of the map to the other, and the town's library where all the answers lie. Answers so well thought out that they allowed me to see the game in a different light, for what it is beyond its technical flaws, for the care and the thought put into this beautiful world that Nap's team have created. Second thing, wait for a sale. I hate to say this, but it's true. The game's already cheaper than most games at launch, but there are indeed plenty of other indie games out there with a lot better quality and a smaller asking price. The fact that it starts on such a bad foot makes this so hard for me to tell you to just go ahead and buy it. But if you are interested in playing a Zelda-like title on the PlayStation 4, while this isn't probably on par, on its own this is a good indie game that I absolutely think you should check out whenever the big sale comes along. Third thing I will tell you is to keep your expectations indefinite check. It took me 40 hours just to get to the good stuff and start having fun, but even with that said, I still walked away with 70 hours of fun and good times, and those 70 hours just shouldn't be ignored. The last thing I will tell you is that if you ever get stuck, feel free to refer to this constructive criticism I've laid out to see if you can find any answers or clues. You can look at where I went wrong and use those lessons to enhance your experience with the game. That's all I have to give. Oh, and one thing, I think I mentioned something about it not being a 4 out of 10. I'm gonna try to be objective about this as much as possible. I think the number should be about 6 out of 10 at this point in time. But if I had to rate my personal experience with the game, I'm probably leaning towards a 7 out of 10. It is a beautiful, charming, and a baffling odyssey. And with that, your Guardian Raven draws to a conclusion. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Oh, 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 oh.